Hey guys, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. It is our desire that through today's word, you encounter God in an entirely new way. We hope that you enjoy this message. This is kind of one of those words today for us that prepares us as people for our future. Not just here, but in heaven. And I want to talk about how dangerous it is when we make these deals with the devil. Because the deals that we make with the devil are not like we make with people on a daily basis. You know, when you make a, a deal in business on the planet, generally you're looking somebody in the face at some point, shaking a hand, writing out a contract, you're doing something. But deals with the devil are so much more subtle than that. The way that we make deals with the devil is he finds a chink in our armor. It doesn't have to be a very big one. If he can just find some kind of a place. And he begins to pick away at that spot subtly, quietly. And he's patient too. It doesn't happen all at once. Because none of us, I think, are unintelligent enough to say yes to somebody who would run up to us with a pitchfork, horns, and a tail that is red-skinned and say, I want you to commit a terrible sin. And we'd be like, I don't think that's a good idea. No, I'm not going to do it. So he doesn't go at us that way. He finds that spot, that place that we tell people we have under the blood, but secretly, when nobody's around, we kind of hang on to and he begins to work in that spot, that one, and if he can find another one or two. Begins to kind of just tear away a little bit at a time. Just kind of pick at that one spot. and Just kind of tear away that armor just a little bit at a time. Until before you know it, you've fallen and you're in trouble. The story that we're talking about today illustrates this. If you look at uh, Luke chapter 22, contemporary English Verse 3, it says, Then Satan entered the heart of Judas. Before I go any further, let me say something. Be careful. Don't let Satan get in your head, but for sure don't let him get in your heart. That doesn't happen overnight. He's always picking at your head. But when he can get from your head to your heart, you are in danger. Then Satan entered the heart of Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve apostles. And Judas went to talk with the chief priests and the officers of the temple police about how he could help them arrest Jesus. And they were very pleased and offered to pay Judas money. And he agreed and started looking for a chance. Wow, I saw this. Looking for a chance to betray Jesus. That one got my attention. He started looking for a chance to betray Jesus when the crowds were not around. If you go back to verse 2, it says that the chief priest and the teachers of the law of Moses were looking for a way to get rid of Jesus. They were looking for a way to get rid of Jesus. Judas was looking for a way to betray him. You got to... Recipe for disaster going here. They were looking for a way to get rid of Jesus because they were afraid of what the people might do. Oh, God, help me never become afraid of people more than I'm afraid of you. And they were ready to make a deal. They wanted Jesus gone. They wanted him dead because he was threatening their way of life. These were the religious leaders. Jesus threatened their power over the people. And they saw themselves steadily losing control. Because the scriptures talked about how that Jesus, when he spoke, he spoke with authority and in boldness, but it was with love. And they, the people were not used to that coming from religious leaders. Religious leaders had the law, so they were always right. They wore the robes. They had the bells. You have, you're supposed to respect them and give them the highest seat. They commanded the respect of the people. Their message was as dry as toast. 
But everybody was afraid to say anything about it because they had the law. And then here came Jesus. And he started preaching in parables. And he started telling stories that made sense. And he started relating to people. And he started loving them enough to reach out and heal them and care for them and be compassionate. And the religious leaders said, this isn't working. I mean, this guy's helping the people and we're losing control over them. We got to do something. We got to get rid of this guy. Can you imagine, I want you to hear this, can you imagine having God in your presence, but instead of loving him and getting close to him and spending time with him, all you can do is think about how to get rid of him. That's what they were doing, but before you point a finger, that's what we do too sometimes. It's easy to look back at them and say, man, I'll tell you what, those guys were dogs. We say, well, hang on a minute. When was the last time that the Spirit of God was trying to move in your life that you got up and left? Because as Pastor Adam said, it was lunchtime. God wanted to move. He had, he had some time. He should have got it done. It's time for lunch. We got to go. And... These people had a job of manipulating people using the law. And just because they were religious and just because they represented the law, that didn't make them good people. Can I give you a word? This isn't the message, but let me give this to you. Watch out for religious people who just use Christianity to make a living or to control others. Are they out there? Oh, yeah. Any of you that are considering going into pastoring, God's laying that on your heart. He's calling you. You need to understand something. Pastoring is a life of service and sacrifice and submission to a greater cause than your own. If you're going at it for any other reason, then you're going to fail. If you're going to do this because it looks like a fun thing to do and a good way to get paid, boy, you're, you're missing it on both counts. It is not a fun thing to do. If you're not called to do it, you will not last. If it's what you're called to do, you can't do anything else and it will bring you great satisfaction and joy. But if it's what you're not called to do, you better not do it. It will eat your lunch. If you're doing it because you think it'd be a, just a fun way not to have to dig ditches or whatever, I'm going to tell you something. If, if, if you don't know what God wants you to do and you think you might just try pastoring because it seems like more fun than something else, go do something else. I promise you, you'll have a better time digging ditches than you would trying to pastor if you're not called to do it. These guys just looked at religion as a job, as a way of getting the money of the people, of a way of controlling the people. And they hated Jesus because he came along and he loved the people. And he healed the people. He had time for the people. He served the people. He sacrificed with the people. When they were hungry, he fed the people. He knew they were taking advantage of him. He, Jesus knew. He knew that some of them were only showing up for the free meal and the healing. He knew that. But he still loved them. And the religious leaders were saying, this guy is killing us. He's setting a bar that's too high for any of us to want to follow. We got to get rid of him. They couldn't recognize that God himself was in their midst. Their religion was so important to them that they missed the relationship of being able to spend time with God in the flesh. They're so upset. They're so jealous. They're so afraid. And then there's Judas. That's another story. Judas. He's one of the 12. Handpicked. By Jesus himself. He spent three years hanging around with Jesus. Everywhere Jesus goes, Judas goes with him. Judas is, he's there, he, he gets to see every miracle. He's one of the guys that when Jesus is breaking the loaves and the fish, the scripture said that Jesus 
didn't, that he didn't just break it and hand it to the people. Jesus would break it and hand it to the disciples, and the disciples would dispense it to the people. They got to be a part of the miracle. Judas was there passing out fish and loaves. He's on the inside. He's even the treasurer of the group. He handles the money. And when you go to the Last Supper, the very Last Supper, Jesus is sitting there with his disciples. He's breaking the bread. He's passing the cup. He's talking about how the bread represents his body's going to be broken. His blood is representative of the cup that's going to be shed, right? Judas is sitting right there. He's eating the bread. He's drinking the juice. Jesus is talking about, hey, when are y'all going to betray me? Judas sitting right there drinking the cup. I mean, we're, we're like, how do you do that? At any moment... Judas could come to his senses. He could surrender his flesh. He could could die to himself. He could repent of his sinful heart. He, He could stop this madness. But instead, he left the actual dinner to go betray Jesus. I mean, he chews up the the bread, drinks the juice, sits it down, says, fellas, I got something I got to take care of. Are you kidding me? That'd be like, taking communion here this morning, walking outside, getting in your car, and going right back to the same sinful life. Uh Uh-oh, uh-oh, hey, 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 hey. Pastor, you didn't have to go there. And I wonder what it will take for some of us. We hear the word of God every week. We know the truth. We hear the still, small voice of God And yet we keep seeking ways to avoid him, to escape him, to free ourselves from his conviction. And God is screaming to us this morning. Run back to Jesus before you realize you've gone so far that you've made a deal with the devil. So how does it happen? I want you to write these down. I'm going to to point this out to you. Three things about those verses I just read to you. Here's how it happened for Judas. Here's how it could happen for you. Deals with the devil start with, number one, a conversation. It's there in verse four. It's quiet in here. I want it to be. I want you to think right now with me for a few minutes. I want you in heaven worse than I want you not to be mad at me. So this started with a conversation. Just an idea. Fellas, just a thought. A thought that he let take root. A thought that he allowed himself to continue thinking about. A fleeting thought, perhaps, which was not a sin. It's never a sin that a, that a temptation or a thought will come your way. But we have the ability to choose what we're going to think about. We have the ability to tell the enemy, I'm not going to think that thought. I'm not going to walk that road. I'm not going to do that thing. We have the ability, walking in the power of the Spirit, that when those things come to us, we can stop right then and we can tell the devil, I'm not hearing it. I'm not thinking it. But Judas, he just went and visited with the fellas. That's it. He just entertained the thought at first. Pastor, there's no harm in checking out my options, are there? Yes. Yes, certainly. That's what the Bible says. 2 Timothy 2.22. Run from temptations that capture young people. Always do the right thing. Be faithful, loving, and easy to get along with. Worship with people whose hearts are pure. James 4, 7. Surrender to God. Resist the devil. And he'll run from you. 
So just a little conversation can be so bad. Just a little conversation, just a li- little bit of listening can be so bad. It's not so bad, Pastor. Every once in a while, I allow myself to indulge in the thought I shouldn't have. I allow myself to indulge in something I shouldn't do. But the Lord knows I love him. I'm not doing any of this stuff in front of weaker brothers and sisters. Sometimes we are. Sometimes we're doing it in front of the world. We don't care. Just a little conversation. Can listening be so bad? I heard a story about a, about a, a, a lady who was supposed to take her mother-in-law to the doctor. And it was time to go to the appointment. She looked outside and her mother-in-law's out there on the fence talking to a neighbor. And they've been out there and they're just going and just going for minutes and minutes and minutes. And she's looking at her watch like, we're going to be late. So finally she runs out there and she says to her mother-in-law, Mom, we got to go. We got to go. And so she kind of pulls her away from the conversation, gets her in the car. And as they're putting on her seatbelts, getting ready to pull away, the daughter-in-law said to the, to the daughter, she said, I'm so sorry that I'm making us late. But she said, no matter what I did, I could not stop that woman from listening to me. (laughs) You have the ability to stop listening to the devil. The lies that he spreads only lead to destruction. And deals with him start with just a simple conversation, but it's a conversation that you have the right and the authority to put a stop to. So stop it right now. Some of you in the room are hearing me right now. You have, you have been entertaining thoughts. It's, done, it's been nothing but that. But you, you've had thoughts and you've been, entertain, you've been allowing yourself to think some things that you know you should not. The scripture says we need to have the mind of Christ. Think on these things and The scripture lists for us good things to think about. It starts with a conversation. Verse 5 and 6a, though, it leads to compromise. Look at that. Look at your scripture. They offered to pay him, and he agreed to take it. Now, up to now, it hadn't been so damning. But now it's gone from thinking about it and talking about it, entertaining it. He's agreed to do it. He hasn't done it yet, but he's agreed to do it. He, he was just thinking about it, but now he's thought, mm, I, I've thought about this long enough and hard enough. I think that I'll do it. I think I will. I haven't done it, but I think I will. So now you're attempting to ignore the Holy Spirit, the conviction that's screaming in your spirit. You're planning on how to carry it out. How are you going to hide it? How are you going to get away with it? This is dangerous ground. Um, You've been compromised because you've been willing to compromise. Merritt Malloy made this statement years ago. Compromise is simply changing the question to fit the answer. That's what we do. We better not ignore... The Holy Spirit, when it comes to this, there are some things that we cannot afford to compromise on. There was a family that was living in New York. They decided they wanted to be uh, cowboys and cowgirls. They wanted to own a ranch. So they moved to the West. They bought them a ranch. They got them some cattle. They've been at this for five or six months. The friends decided to fly out and see how everything's going, right? So uh, they got there and they said to the, hu- to the man, the owner, the husband, they said, what's the name of the ranch? He said, we didn't even see the name. What, what did you decide to name the ranch? And he said, well, it's, been, it's kind of been a struggle. He said, I, I wanted to name it the Bar J, but my wife wanted to name it the Susie Q. And my son liked the Flying W and my other son liked the Lazy Y. So he said, what we decided to do, we were going to call it the Bar J, Susie Q, Flying W, Lazy Y. And the family said, well, that's cool. Where's all the cows, though? And he said, well, none of them survived the branding. <laughs> they were all steaks by the time they got done. Cooked well done. That's funny, but here's the scoop. If you deny and if you ignore the Holy Ghost, you won't survive this decision. 
Are you still hearing me? Your family, your witness, your reputation will not survive this compromise. Wake up. And number three, started with a conversation, leads to compromise, and it ends in catastrophe. Verse six, he agreed and started looking for a chance to betray Jesus when the crowds were not around. Nobody ever decided to commit their sin where everybody could see it. But you wait and try to find that place where nobody will know. And this is not just dangerous now. It's become destructive. It's become a, it's a disaster it's right around the corner. So Judas is trying to find a time when nobody is around to carry out this terrible decision. Why is he doing that? Well, the, the reason that Scripture would talk about is doing it because the religious leaders said, hey, it's too hard to, re- to arrest him. The people love him. We don't want to do it in broad daylight because they may attack us. But I submit that that's true, but there might have been another reason too. Judas is in agreement with that because he really don't want to do it in front of the guys that are hanging around with Jesus because they might beat the fool out of him. Peter's not going to be happy with this. Am I right? Judas is like, we'll do this, but hmm, I don't really want the boys to know. Isn't it amazing how that some people can sit under the power of God They can sit in settings like this with sin in their life, blatant sin in their life, that they know they're continuously living in. Can't wait to leave here to go get back involved in it. But they can sit here every week and smile at us and shake our hand, deal with the movement of the Holy Spirit, and just come in and look good, and nobody knows what's going on. And they're good with it, as long as nobody knows. Hey, I'll be here next Sunday, Pastor. I'll be here next Sunday. Come every week and never deal with the sin in their life. And then how shocked they are when the scripture's prophecy comes true that says, be sure your sin will find you out. When it does, then they're down in the altar. I just can't believe my life falling apart. My wife don't want to have nothing to do with me. Really? You idiot? And we don't vocalize it this way, guys. But listen, here's what's happening as a believer. When you get to this place, when you have ignored... All, everything to this point, you've ignored the Holy Spirit's conviction, you've entertained the thought, you've you've compromised yourself to go ahead and go through with this, this is what you are saying to Jesus. Now, you say, I would never pray that prayer, that's just stupid, okay? This is what you're saying, as stupid as it sounds, this is what that person is praying when they know better. They are saying this, hey Lord, I'm going to betray you. I'm just looking for the right time to do it when no one but you will see or know. You say, that's ridiculous. I'd never pray that prayer. You're praying that prayer. If you're living that lifestyle, you're praying that prayer. Because you're smart enough to know that he knows. You're smart enough to know he knows. And yet you're denying the conviction in your life So you can gratify your flesh in whatever area that might be. I've said for years, I said, I struggle just like anybody else, but I've said for years, I want to deny the pleasure so I can have the power. I'm going to choose the power over the pleasure. I'd rather walk in the Holy Ghost. I'd I'd rather hear his voice. I would rather be able to move around in this, in the spirit and, And minister, I just just want that so much more than I want the destruction of the flesh. George Bernard Shaw, perhaps most renowned as a free thinker, liberal philosopher, in his last writings, here's what he wrote. Listen to this now. He said, the science to which I pinned my faith is bankrupt. It's councils which should have established the millennium led instead directly to the suicide of Europe. I believe them once in their name. I helped to destroy the faith of millions of worshipers in the temples of a thousand creeds. And now they look at me and witness the great tragedy of an atheist who has lost his faith. Wow. 
Don't allow yourself to come to the end with regrets like that. Nothing on this planet is worth you losing your soul. And for those of you that really, really want to believe that once you're saved, you're always saved, that means you can do whatever you want, I would say to you, read the whole Bible. You once saved, you're always saved, as long as you want to be, as long as you're walking in the Spirit, listening to the voice of God. But I'm going to tell you something, you can walk away from God far enough. You can walk away far enough. See, we want to walk close enough to Him that we hear His whisper. But you can walk far enough away from Him that you won't hear His scream. It's not that you couldn't come back, but you won't come back because you'll get so far away that you won't listen anymore. The father is screaming at the prodigal over and over, but the prodigal at some point, he gets so far away, doesn't hear the voice and he's not coming back. He just doesn't come back. That affair is not worth it. And I'm not just talking to the men. That sin is not worth your soul in hell. That disobedience, that rebellion, that greed, that lust, that anger, that control, that hatred, that unforgiveness is just not worth hanging on to it. Run back to God. I implore you this morning. Turn from the sin. Repent and come clean. Get back in right relationship with the Lord and you'll live abundantly. You live free from all that mess. Stop right now. Don't go any further. But refuse to make any deals with the devil. Stop the conversation. Stop the compromise. Stop the, stop the catastrophe. Before they destroy your life and your soul. Some of you are hanging on. Because you said, well, I've never gotten caught yet. I've been in this for years. I've been in this for years. I had not gotten caught yet. Some of you have been caught. But you're like, well, she hadn't left me yet. He hadn't left me yet. Heed the tugging of the Holy Ghost. He begs to someone today. Years ago, a man passed by me at another church. And I shook his hand and I did what I always do. I was taught as a boy that when you shake somebody's hand, you know, depending on who it is, if it's a man, you grip it a little bit. If he's... It, you know, if he don't have much grip, don't hurt him, you know? But you kind of match the grip to some extent. And with the ladies, you be careful. I've actually heard their bones pop, and I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry. My hands aren't that big, but, you know. But I was always taught when you shake somebody's hand, you shake, your, you shake their hand, you look them in the eyes. Huh? Anybody that won't look you in the eyes got something to hide. Don't trust them. Don't do no business deal with somebody that won't look you right in the face, in the eyeballs. They're probably lying about something. This man walked out through the church and as he walked out, I did what I'd always done. I grabbed him by the hand. Shook his hand, I looked him right in the eyes, I smiled at him, I said, have a good week. And he, I turned loose his hand and he stood there and he looked at me for me and he said, I don't like it when you do that. And I said, what? He said, when you look at me like that. And I said, how? He said, when you look at me, pastor, he said, you look right through me into my soul and I don't like it. Some of y'all, when you're leaving today, you're going to be like, I'm going to look him dead in the face. <laughs> Because I do not want to be next week's illustration. <laughs> Him getting up talking about, well, brother so-and-so last week didn't want to look me in the face. I guess he need to get in the altar. <laughs> Got sin in his life. And there have been times, there have been times where the Holy Spirit, you know, will say, scary because it doesn't happen a lot He'll, he shows me things and tells me things and te every once in a while but most of the time it's not somebody's sin 
Most of the time it's a word he has, something he wants to, but there, there are times where he can show you and tell you things and you're like, ooh, that scares me. That means he knows what I'm up to. And I'm saying, I don't know what you're up to. I don't know what you're up to. And if the Holy Ghost were to tell me, I would not point you out and say, you, you are, you and you, I, I'm not. But I probably, when I get a chance, I'm going to get you off the side. I'm going to say, hey, is this what's going on here? Better get that in check. A lot of people, a lot of people can't come clean, can't, can't come clean with Jesus. If they can't look the preacher in the face, how are they going to look God in the face and give an account for their life? He calls you up today and you're standing in front of him and you just kind of stand and they're looking down. Because you know, you know what's in your heart and in your soul. And you know he's looking right through it. Oh, and I'm going to tell you something. You are doubly responsible now because you made the mistake of being at Trinity Fellowship this morning. You heard it. You heard the truth this morning preached with as much love and boldness as you'll ever hear it in your life. You got nowhere to go. You don't have but two choices. Get mad and hang on to your sin. Or run to Jesus and repent. We're going to take communion today. Just like they did in the story. Let me tell you something. Don't be Judas. Do not take this communion. If you're going to hang on to the sin, don't do it because you'll eat and drink damnation to yourself. That's what the word says. Many are sick and weak among you and many sleep. They sleep through days like this. Some people probably even die. So don't take the communion out of peer pressure. Let it. If you are not going to repent, I'm not manipulating you right now. If you are not ready to turn loose, then don't take communion. Don't add that to the rest of it. Don't put that on top of the rest of it. But every person in the room that would say, I want to be able to take this communion can. That's the good news. Every person in this room that got here this morning who was in the throes of one of these places, you walked in today having that conversation in your mind. You came in here thinking about that thing. Some of you are in the compromise portion of this where that you've already passed the thinking and you were already in the planning stages of how you're going to pull it off and not get caught. And some of you are past that. You're in, you're in a catastrophe spot to where you are right on the precipice. If you're not caught yet, you're getting ready to get caught. But the Holy Spirit is begging you, is convicting you, is in your soul right now. You know without me having to call out your... I don't have to point you out and tell you what it is. I can sense some things right now. I'm not... I'm, not, I'm going to look right down the middle of the aisle. So I don't look at anybody. But some of you are living in relationships right now. You, I don't care what, what generation you're the product of. It is still a sin for men and women to live together and to sleep together if they are not married. And that's the lifestyle you're living right now. I don't care if that makes you mad or not. That didn't come from me. That's the word of God. Some of you are involved in some things in your life. Whether it be alcohol or drugs, whatever. You're using something to alter your frame of mind because you don't like the place that you're in. And because you are choosing to alter your mind with these things, the Holy Spirit is telling you, I, want, I, I am testing you. I want you to put your faith and trust in me. You're turning to that. You're believing in its power more than you're believing in mine. Some of you are doing it legally. 
It's not that you're taking illegal drugs. You're drinking alcohol right off the shelf that anybody can buy. Too much of it. You're taking pills that you got from a doctor when you don't need them. And every time you take it, the Holy Spirit tells you, you know you're not supposed to be doing that. Yeah, but Lord, you know sometimes I need it. I'm going to tell you something. There's a lot of people on this planet that you can afford to argue with, but God is not one of them. Argue with anybody else you want, whether you're right or wrong, but don't argue with God. Some of you guys and gals need to go home Clean up that mess off of your computer. Yeah. Some of you are having conversations with people, various platforms, media platforms. You're having conversations with people that you know you shouldn't be having, but it's fun because nobody, you're, they live a long way away, nothing's ever gonna happen, which is, it, which is fun. I'm telling you, it's not just fun, it's sin. Now you're like, oh God, please don't make him tell me to come forward because I don't want him. And I'm not, I'm not. I'll put your mind to ease. Some of you are going to want to come forward. Some of you are, some of you are sitting there right now saying, I wish he'd shut up because I want to get to the altar. And they're going to be open. But some of you are like, I cannot, I cannot. I can't come forward because she's going to ask me or he's going to ask me why. Now why'd you go forward this morning? Which one of those was yours you've been hiding from me? I'm not going to make you get up and come forward. I don't need that for my ego to be able to write down in my journal, preach this message and 15 people came. I don't need that. I don't need that. I just have one goal. I want all of us to go to heaven. I cannot bear the thought of anybody on my watch not being there when we rally up. I can't bear the thought of anybody on any watch, buddy's watch not being there. But if I were to know that people that were within our own flock who sat and heard the word of God and who were involved in worship services like we had this morning didn't make heaven, I'd be, oh my God, what else would it have taken? And God would say to me, well, here's the same thing I told them. Lazarus said... Let me go back and warn my brothers. I said, it won't do no good. They, they've got the prophets and they won't listen to them. Just let me go tell no, it won't do no good. We're not going to get no more than what we got, which is the word and the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And if you don't respond to that, there's nothing left. There is no other sacrifice greater to offer than Jesus. There's not going to be another one. Nothing else is going to happen. This is it. You're either going to live for him or you're not. But we got to quit making deals with the devil. We lose every time when we make deals with the devil. Hey, thanks again for checking out our YouTube channel. For updates on sermons or other online content, be sure to click the subscribe button below. For more information on Trinity Fellowship and all of our many ministries, you can check us out on all of our social media platforms, or you can go to our website at trinitynwa.com. Again, thanks for checking us out. We hope to see you here soon.